Welcome to the uh, Progressive Magazine and a live book event tonight streaming on Facebook and also YouTube. Our guest this evening is Frank Smythe and his brand new book, The NRA, The Unauthorized History. And uh, we're very pleased to have Frank with us. If, um, if you're not familiar with the Progressive Magazine, we are a 112-year-old political magazine based in Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, coming out bi-monthly in print and also on the web at progressive.org. You can read uh, all of our content online, so please check it out. Also, if you would like to get a copy of the book uh, for from tonight's uh, event, for a $50 donation to the Progressive Magazine, we will mail you a hardbound copy of this book, and uh, you'll be hearing all about it coming up in the next hour or so. So uh, I encourage you to check it out. If you go to progressive.org slash events, you will see the link to uh, order a copy of that book. Well, without further ado, I want to bring on uh, my longtime friend and uh, uh, very accomplished journalist and author, Frank Smythe. Welcome to uh, the uh, program tonight, Frank. Thank you, Norm. Very pleased to have you with us. So um, the book, which people can see in the background on your shelf there, is uh, the NRA, The Unauthorized History. And we're going to talk for a little while. Actually, Frank is going to talk for a little while, and then the two of us will talk for a little bit and also take your questions, which you can put into the chat through uh, either Facebook or um, through YouTube. So please, please do that. And we've got somebody monitoring the chat to uh, help with those questions as well. And I'll be uh, feeding those questions to Frank as we go. But Frank, I'm going to uh, turn it over to you and let you uh, take the helm here. And then uh, I'll be back in a little bit and we can talk some more. Thank you, Norm. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm going to talk for about, I think, 35 minutes or so and then open it up to Norm and then to your questions, which I think will be the most interesting part uh, of the event tonight. As you know, this is the third anniversary, most of you know, of the Parkland, Florida, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting uh, three years ago that uh, resulted in uh, 17 fatalities, I believe, and a number more injured. Um, and it also uh, led to students from Parkland High School, surviving students, taking a lead to energize the gun reform movement. And they've accomplished a lot. We're going to talk about that, though I still think there are a number of hurdles ahead uh, in terms of uh, implementing meaningful and lasting uh, gun reform, gun control in the United States. Biden's gun plan today on the third anniversary, President Biden announced that he put his gun plan that he's had in the works now uh, since he was a candidate. He's now announced he's going to attempt to put it into, uh, turn these uh, proposals into law. Number one, they would eliminate or reduce the, uh, the, the ruling uh, before that was passed or the law that was passed under the Burson administration, W, that protected gun manufacturers from lawsuits for the misuse of their weapons in mass shootings. Biden is seeking to, uh, to reestablish legal liability for gun manufacturers, number one. And for those of you in favor of gun reform, that's an, it would be an important step if it could be achieved. Number two, he wants to implement robust and universal background checks. Robust and universal background checks, which failed in 2013, after the Parkland, excuse me, after the Newtown, Connecticut, Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting uh, involving largely second grade classrooms and uh, uh, young people and their teachers. Uh, so that, and that I think has the best chance of success in what Biden is proposing. Number three, Biden would uh, out ban high capacity magazines, magazines that would carry more than 10 rounds of ammunition. And four, Today, he said uh, that he would uh, impose an assault weapons ban. Now, all of these measures would, if they were all come to pass, would impose the toughest gun laws in our nation's history. And that is significant, although I think we're still a long way off from seeing that come to fruition for those of you that would wish to see that. Back in 1994, Congress and the Clinton administration passed a law which was a 10-year temporary assault weapons ban. And it failed in the end largely because 
the, they had defined assault weapons that would be banned based on their cosmetic features, whether they had a pistol grip in front or whether they had a flash suppressor, things that really don't matter in terms of the semi-automatic capability of what defines assault weapon, which is being semi-automatic and having the capacity to have more than 10 rounds of ammunition, at least according to the trade press. Um, Biden's gun plan includes gun registration. And everyone in favor of gun reform needs to realize this is a red line for the gun rights movement. And I think we're going to see over the next coming days uh, a movement and a reaction to Biden's gun plan. And I think it has the potential to unite people from Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz all the way over to Mitch McConnell and possibly even depending on the measures under consideration, even people like Mitt Romney. And I think that's something that uh, needs to be taken into account. Because the fact of the matter is today, February 14th, 2021, both the movement for gun reform and the movement for, for gun rights are stronger than ever. Each side is stronger than ever, which is almost hard to believe, but it sets the stage for an epic battle, which is going to take a very long time before it is done. Now, the gun reform movement has contributed to the 81 million uh, record uh, voter turnout for Biden-Harris, the trifecta, the House, the Senate, and the White House all going to the Democrats, all going to gun reform Democrats. Um, but the gun movement, the gun rights movement, contributed to turning out 74 million voters, another record, less than Biden-Harris, but more than Obama-Biden in previous elections. And another indicator of the gun movement's strength today is the fact that over the past 11 months, since the start of the pandemic, we have seen nearly uh, record gun sales nearly every month since last March. Gun sales fueled by the pandemic, gun sales fueled by the protest against the health measures designed to curb the pandemic, uh, uh, gun sales fueled by the Black Lives Matter protests spiking the week after the death in police custody of George Floyd, and gun sales fueled by the Capitol, January 6th Capitol takeover, right? Uh, on top of that, uh, there is now a nationwide shortage of ammunition, something we've never seen in this nation war, because so many people have been buying so much ammunition that vendors, both over-the-counter vendors and online vendors, have been unable to keep up with demand, which uh, is really quite phenomenal. We also see, just this week, 23 attorney generals from 23 red states signed on to an amicus brief supporting the NRA's lawsuit, along with a local partner against New York State challenging New York State's restrictions on, on the inability for most citizens to carry concealed handguns. And that also is a trend which demonstrates the strength of this movement and the depth and breadth it has today in the Republican Party. Uh, if you remember, or perhaps you don't, the NRA would never spoke at either major party's political convention uh, until 2016, when an NRA representative, then Chris Cox, now forced out uh, in the current uh, infighting, spoke at the NRA annual convention uh, in Cleveland in 2016, the same convention that nominated Trump, right? So what's happened over the past four years is the NRA has not moved as much as the Republican Party has moved to it. And instead of being seen on the margins of the Republican Party, still close to the mainstream, but a little bit to the margins, now uh, the NRA is dead set within the middle planks of the Republican Party. And I think that poses a tremendous challenge for any people uh, in or out of the administration who are interested in pursuing uh, gun reform. And I also think that Biden's plan to heal the nation uh, is going to conflict with his uh, plans to implement gun control. And that's something that we're going to see play out over the coming years. Now, um, this all happens as the NRA itself is in trouble, more trouble than ever before. I told NPR uh, uh, last year, uh, after the attorney general lawsuit was filed, that I did not think that Leticia James, the New York attorney general, would be able to achieve to dissolve the NRA because the NRA had so many legitimate activities supporting the, sh the shooting sports, hunting, competitive shooting around the country, that that would be a difficult thing to get a court to accept. But now I think it's clear that the NRA is moving in the direction of, of dissolving itself because it is not going to survive. It is not going to remain intact uh, from the New York Attorney General investigation into alleged embezzlement. 
And I'm also going to argue and, and demonstrate uh, to you that the roots of this embezzlement scam will go back uh, nearly 44 years. Now, how did we get to where we are today, where the gun reform movement is stronger than ever and gun control is finally on the table for the first time, I would argue, uh, in over 50 years since the days of President Johnson? And we can talk about that if you wish. The answer lies in the buried history of the NRA and the buried history of gun control that is intertwined with the NRA and has been for a long time. Because the NRA has shaped the conversation in this country so much that the points of reference that we have when we think about gun control, it's like we're wearing blinders and we don't see everything that's out there and we don't realize we have blinders on. And I'm gonna show you that. And if you wish, you can look at this talk as an exhumation of the NRA's buried past, as well as aspects of American and world history that they've also tried to bury. And we'll see what the disinterment uh, digs up. Now, I'm also gonna lay out for you some of the NRA's lies, some of the NRA's big lies, which are extremely important and I think is one of the areas where they are vulnerable. Uh, big lie number one, even a little gun control can precipitate a slide to disarmament and then all the way to genocide. In other words, you can't have a little gun control without giving up all your guns and ultimately all your freedom. This has no basis in fact, and I'm going to dissect it for you. But uh, keep in mind, it's a very strong belief out there. And so far, the gun reform movement, neither the Parkland students nor the surviving Newtown parents nor the Aurora parents uh, nor others, in the, or Shannon Watts and others. Who, Shannon Watts is very good, and she engages in a number of issues which I think advance the gun reform agenda. But so far, these lies have gone unchallenged. And Biden himself has never addressed his gun plan until finally today when he put some meat on the bone. And the essence of the gun plan, the part that is most objectionable to the gun rights crowd is gun registration. And that is an issue that nobody has addressed. Biden has never addressed it in his career, as far as I know. The administration hasn't adjust, uh, uh, addressed it, but I think this is going to become a flashpoint in the days and weeks and months uh, and probably years to come. Now, um, the NRA has two Achilles heels, like the metaphor would suggest. We all have two Achilles heels. One of them is their embezzlement scandal. And the one thing to keep in mind is this does not come from the New York Attorney General out of the blue. The embezzlement scandal began with Oliver North when he, he was brought in to be president of the NRA at the NRA annual meeting in Dallas in 2018. I was there and I was also at the board meeting. And Oliver North was brought in because they needed a strong voice to stand up to the Parkland students, which really uh, shook up the NRA. They were concerned about uh, the energy that was coming from the Parkland students for gun reform. But Oliver North started looking at the books of the NRA and he started to find irregularities and he started to call them out. And but with, by 2019, at the next annual meeting, the scandal erupted in the press in the Wall Street Journal, where Oliver North, backed by people like Ted Nugent, not the people you might expect to be whistleblowers, accusing LaPierre and others of massive embezzlement, along with complicity, as it turns out, according to the New York Attorney General of the NRA board. A year later, in 2020, the New York Attorney General filed a lawsuit against the NRA, seeking to dissolve it over evidence of, of massive embezzlement. And what was missed in the stories that came out is that dissonant number one is cited for, uh, for documents in that New York Attorney General lawsuit. And that is identified as the NRA president at the time, Oliver North, along with other unnamed dissident board members. The NRA then announced this year that they are defiling bankruptcy and moving to Texas. And, uh, but three things happened uh, this week that throw that into doubt and are going to make the, the, their NRA's plans for a, uh, an easy exit out of New York, escaping accountability in New York, I think all but impossible now. Number one, a Kansas district judge who was an NR, ex-NRA board member filed uh, in court in, in NR, the, the same court where the NRA filed for bankruptcy, asking for an independent examiner to examine LaPierre's finances. And he also said that uh, LaPierre went and filed for bankruptcy without the approval of the NRA's own board of directors in violation of its bylaws, which doesn't sound like much, but it's a, it's a, it poses a huge problem for the NRA. The NRA's former PR partner, uh, Acker McQueen, also 
filed a motion to dismiss the Lewis lawsuit, Ackerman McQueen being the NRA's largest unsecured debtor, to, uh, to, uh, to dismiss the lawsuit because they feel they're just trying to get out of the debts that they're owed. And the New York Attorney General has filed a similar suit uh, just a day or two ago, uh, or similar motion to dismiss that uh, bankruptcy proceeding. But the NRA's other Achilles heel lies in, lies in the lies, the tall tales, the fairy tales, the fabulous inventions that the NRA has told about itself as well as about American and world history. Big lie number two for the NRA, which is now its mantra on the NRA website and in NRA publications, and that they only really rolled out in writing explicitly in 2013 after the second inauguration of the first black president in the United States, Barack Obama. It was 2013 that the NRA started to put in writing and then, and then adopt as its new slogan that the NRA is the oldest civil rights organization in the nation and that the NRA was founded to support the Second Amendment, right? Neither of these claims are true whatsoever. And then in 2018, five years later, people associated with the NRA and NRA officials themselves started to put meat on the bone of that or this new origin story for the NRA, which is what it was. And they started to claim Candace Owens, for instance, said on Fox News that as a black American woman, she knows that the NRA was founded in support of the Second Amendment and as a civil rights group. And she claimed that the early NRA helped arm freed slaves during Reconstruction after the Civil War to help secure their Second Amendment rights. Later that year, Alan West, an NRA board director, a Christian conservative commentator, and also now the, the chair of the Texas GOP, who made We Are the Storm, the QAnon phrase, the new slogan of the Texas GOP. Um, Alan West also claimed and wrote, as an American black man, I have thought about the NRA's history and I have reflected on it, he said. And then he claimed too, like Candace Owens, that the early NRA helped stood with freed slaves to help secure their Second Amendment rights. And he repeated this at the NRA annual meeting in 2019 in Indianapolis, the last NRA, NRA meeting held since the start of the pandemic. I was there as well. Now, none of this is true. Not a word of this is true. And this is where one place where the NRA is very vulnerable. Because the NRA was founded by two men in New York City, both living in Brooklyn, a man named William Cone at Church and George Wood Wingate. William Cone at Church was a man who was the, the most influential military writer of his age. He had served as a, as a journalist during the early years of the war, reported for the New York Times, used the pseudonym Pierre Pont, named for a street in Brooklyn, and also later became a brevet lieutenant colonel in charge of the home militia defense around Washington. Really, I think he got the position to hobnob with the high command, including, including uh, people like President Grant, or, or excuse me, uh, General Grant, who he admired very much, and then later was recruited to run something called the Army and Navy Journal out of New York City to support the Union effort, which became, in the end, the longest running military journal in the history of the country. The other NRA co-founder was a man named George Wood Wingate, who had served in the Civil War uh, uh, in Carlisle during the Battle of Gettysburg, who was a master uh, rifleman as well as a master rifle trainer. And he also happened to be the prep, one of the co-founders and presidents of the New York School Pub Public Schools Athletic League. And for those of you from New York, you may, you may re recall that the top athlete for boys as well as girls in New York City in each sport still gets the Wingate Award at the end of the year. And he was also a pioneer in bringing uh, expanding sports to girls in 1905 before most of the rest of uh, the schools in other parts of the country were doing so. But they saw something that occurred. They were following events in Europe. And remember, this is during Reconstruction, but it's also on the eve of the Gilded Age. And the United States had been transformed and was becoming a great power uh, or be, uh, and emerging uh, on the world stage. And they expected the United States to be drawn into future wars involving European powers. And they had watched as the Kingdom of Prussia, a smaller empire, had defeated first the, king, the, the Empire of Austria and then the Empire of France. In both cases, Austria and France were expected to win, especially France, and the Prussians won. And what Wingate and Church concluded, and the, and the evidence bears it out, is that, the, is that the Prussians beat the Austrians and the French 
by having better rifles, rear loading rifles, rifles that uh, you you load from the back as opposed to from the front, like a like a musket uh, would. That are also were also more accurate and had more firepower, uh, more range than uh, than the other muskets. But they also the Prussians also had very well trained riflemen who were able to pick off sharpshooters, enemy uh, enemy uh, combatants from beyond the range at which the enemy could fire back. And this alarmed Church and, and Wingate, who had already seen an appalling lack of marksmanship on both sides during the Civil War. So they formed the NRA in 1871 as a private initiative in order to, in order to per, create a rifle practice group whose goal was nothing to do with the Second Amendment, but to raise the standard of riflery among the National Guard, first the New York National Guard, military, army, navy, or army soldiers and others, as well as able bodied men to, you know, to better prepare the United States in case of a future expected war with European powers. Now, they, uh, they lobbied money and they lobbied uh, the State House in Albany and they secured funding from New York State, the same New York State that is now seeking through a lawsuit to dissolve the NRA in 1871, gave the NRA money in order to train New York National Guard uh, guardsmen. And, they, and the NRA used that money to build a range in Queens called the Creedmoor Range. Now, this is gonna sound ironic for a group that claims to be founded to support the Second Amendment, but they modeled, their, they took their name, the range design, the scoring system, and even the targets down to solid iron targets, nearly a half ton apiece, on the National Rifle Association of the United Kingdom inaugurated 12 years before by Queen Victoria herself, Her Majesty's NRA. So you could see why the, the modern NRA, the NRA since 1977, want to keep that uh, quiet. And the NRA beat the Irish on their own range in 1874. And then in 1877, they, they invited the British NRA to come over and compete against them. And they sent the Imperial team, the best riflemen from the British Isles, and the NRA won. So this was... The early end, and 1877 was the last year of Reconstruction, and they spent the, the, their, their, all their efforts during this period were consumed by rifle competitions, uh, and including international competitions, and now they have finally beat the British. They beat their own role models. Wingate set up the American NRA and the rifle system to be able to be as good, if not better, than the British, and now they beat the British. This is the early NRA's finest hour, a Victorian era triumph. And something you would think the modern NRA would want to celebrate. But no one in the NRA seems to know anything about this. No one in the modern NRA will say anything about this because it contradicts with their big lie that they were founded to support the Second Amendment. And this is everything that I'm telling you is in the book, but it's also all documented to original NRA documents dating back 150 years as well as since. Now, the NRA after World War II grew exponentially from less than 100,000 members in 1945 to up to a million uh, by 1968. And while before the NRA was dominant by competitive shooters, uh, since uh, World War II, it's been dominated by hunters. Now, the NRA lost its funding from Albany, but in 1903, it secured federal funding with the help of President Teddy Roosevelt. And that federal funding allowed the NRA to host rifle competitions and pistol competitions for the guard, military, and able-bodied men, as well as later police over the next 60 years, right up to the days of the Vietnam War. And they, uh, they ran those competitions through the 20th century at a range on Lake Erie in Ohio, which still exists, called Camp Perry. Now, a few things happened that are instrumental, I think, uh, for today in the 1920s. Number one, in 1925, the NRA had its first embezzlement scandal, where some executive officers were moving money around, and it seemed like there was, they, were, they were pocketing it for themselves. A man named Milton Record, a highly decorated uh, Maryland National Guard commander, was served in the, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the World War I and World War II, won the Croix de Guerre, the Distinguished Service Medal with uh, uh, twice the Bronze Star. Uh, he cleaned this up in 1925. He set up a system of checks and balances so no one could operate like these people had uh, without scrutiny. And he also established a system of financial transparency, and this is most important, and published the actual, not the sanitized, but the actual NRA annual reports 
in the, uh, the NRA's American Rifleman magazine, which these are leather bound volumes of, of, uh, of the NRA going through the years. And I have a, I th we think one of the largest collections uh, that, it, that may exist. And they published these annual reports to make sure that everybody knew the NRA's finances along with the system of checks and balances. And it lasted for 50 years or 52 uh, years until the 19th, what occurred in 1977, which I'm coming to. Now, something else happened in the 1920s. You had organized crime, Bonnie and Clyde, bank robbers, Al Capone, bootleggers. And this rise in organized crime led the NRA to apply a balancing test, something that would be an anathema to the current uh, modern leaders of the NRA. And the balancing test weighed the interest of gun owners against the interest of public safety and the need to keep, to make it harder for arms to get into criminal hands. So the NRA leadership, including Milton Record, supported the National Firearms Act in 1934, which Record in an NRA oral history when he was 92 in 1974 said was a sane, reasonable, and effective law. The oral history was buried. The NRA, the NRA has buried the legacy of Record along with nearly five generations of military leaders, one of them uh, that I accused them of burying, and they, they just they just exhumed themselves because he didn't say anything objectionable about gun control. But it's hard for them to exhume anymore because nearly the rest of them either had no position on gun control or they supported it, which is um, which is a problem because NRA uh, the NRA big lie number three is we never changed. We've always supported the Second Amendment. We've always uh, been defending gun rights. Not true. The NRA didn't raise gun rights at all until 1922 in an editorial referencing a New York law still on the books, now being challenged by those attorney generals over concealed, uh, over restricting handgun, uh, the ability to carry handguns in New York state. And it also referenced the Bolshevik revolution, the communist revolution that had turned Russia into the Soviet Union. But that was 1922, 51 years after things began. The second amendment was not referenced by anyone in the NRA until 1952 as the second article in the Bill of Rights, and civil rights, which they claim they've been supporting since the beginning, was not referenced until it was referenced as civil liberties in 1968. So this is the third big lie. We've never changed. Not true at all. The change occurred in 1977 in something called the Cincinnati Revolt. This is something an NRA leaders will not talk about and will, will try not to acknowledge, even though they reference it in code themselves. And one NRA president even went to Moscow and gave a speech, which he referenced it quite clearly, perhaps not realizing that that, that, that speech would be uh, video recorded and then might end up to, to a Russian audience, might end up on YouTube as it was where Mother Jones found it. Um, now, what happened in the Cincinnati revolt? The NRA consolidated power. They put, for instance, a new director of publications, meaning the editor of the NRA and the previous editor before that had come from the Saturday Saturday Evening Post that published um, uh, Norman uh, Rockwell's paintings, right? A genuine literary magazine. From now on, all the editors, everybody in the NRA had to had to had to, had to report to someone who was there to make sure that everyone towed the political line, including the magazines, if not especially the magazines. Number two, they ended the practice of financial transparency, meaning that the annual reports disappeared from the magazines. The 76 was the last year they were published. It didn't appear in 77, and they have not appeared since, at least not anything that's real and actually reflects real NRA finances. Uh, they also ended that system of checks and balances too, which leads directly, as I wrote in the New York Daily News, to the embezzlement scandal that, we're, that they're dealing with today. But third and most importantly, the 77 Cincinnati revolt sent the NRA on a new course, uh, what, what they call an unyielding course or an absolutist course, a course that prioritized everything having to do with gun rights. And just to give you a sense, in the 1960s and early 1970s, the NRA was as green as Sierra Club, uh, supporting taking polar bears off their list of, uh, of, 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 of their trophy list, which you can win an award for game, big game trophies decades before they were in danger supporting wildlife conservation efforts in Kenya, in, uh, in Texas, along the Mexican border, uh, looking at things like the Mexican Jaguar, um, running editorials, uh, celebrating Earth Day, the first anniversary of Earth Day in 1971, running editorials saying that man-made pollution posed a threat to wildlife and human life. 
sounding as green as Sierra Club, if not their more radical offshoot, Friends of the Earth, and even running an editorial suggesting a tax on ammunition, which you would never hear today, in order to support wildlife con conservation. But the other thing the NRA did is they co-opted over a century of competitive shooting and hunting. All the gun clubs throughout the country that had been built up over the past 160 years were co-opted into the NRA's new agenda. And they put out a message, and the message was, don't be a FUD. What's a FUD? A FUD is a play on the words of Elmer Fudd, the, the hapless hunter in the Bugs Bunny cartoons. And what it means is, if you're a hunter, you can't just support your right to buy hunting weapons. You have to support the right of all gun owners to buy any weapons they have, any weapons they wish to own, including uh, assault weapons or tactical semi-automatic weapons. And I, by the way, am a FUD because I support gun control. But I also own a signature non-FUD non -FUD gun, a Glock 19. So I'm a paradox uh, for the NRA, and I don't fit into this schematic. But this is they've accomplished this to a large degree. Uh, and I would argue today that of the 74 million people that voted for Trump, many, if not most of them, support the NRA's gun rights agenda. And it seems that nearly all of the Republican Party elected officials today, on the national level as well as on the state level, uh, support the NRA's uh, gun, gun rights agenda. And this is a problem. Now, the new leader of the NRA was a man named Harlan Carter, Harlan B. Carter. And um, I can talk more about him, but he was somebody who, when he was 17, got into a dispute near his home where some boys had been, accu had been accused of, they were loitering near the home and the mother, uh, their, the family car had been stolen three weeks before, and Carter's mother thought maybe these boys are responsible. So he got a shotgun and went after the boys and challenged them and said, you have to come back to talk to my mother. They refused. One of them pulled a knife out to fight, to fight Carter while he was holding the shotgun. Carter shot him. Uh, he lay dying. As he was dying, he bid farewell to his friends and then turned to Carter and said, you're my friend. And Carter said, you're my friend, nothing. And the boys died. And this is all according to court testimony in 1931 when it occurred in the Laredo Times, reported in the Laredo Times in Laredo, Texas, where Carter uh, was the son of a Border Patrol officer. He himself would later become a Border Patrol chief. He was uh, convicted, sentenced to jail, and later had that conviction overturned on appeal. But Carter had managed to keep uh, uh, all that quiet for 50 years by changing his name from Harlan, that he was born, to Harlan, well, the second vowel from an A to an O, to keep it secret for 50 years. So he's somebody who definitely epitomizes the gun rights agenda. And you could say, well, what does that mean? Well, he's actually not only the leader of the Cincinnati Revolt, he's the father of the modern NRA. And we know that because if you go into NRA headquarters in Fairfax, Virginia, you will see the museum there is all about firearms, mainly in, in the U.S. American society, but also uh, elsewhere, showing the power and the determining factors, how important guns are and rifles and other weapons have been, firearms have been, to, uh, to human destiny, I think would be one way to put it. Uh, there are no leaders of the NRA acknowledged at all in that museum or on display with the exception of a five foot pedestal with a giant bronze bust on top of Carter's head and shoulders in the middle of one display room. He is the only NRA leader over five generations, so honored and so revered. And in 2019, in the fall, when, um, when uh, Wayne Lapierre, the current CEO of the NRA, came under fire from his own board in Oliver North for embezzlement charges, he wrote to NRA members, I learned from great leaders such as Harlan B. Carter, brandishing his own credentials to this, to this man, the father of the modern NRA, that they really don't want anyone to know about uh, except their own members who already understand who he is. Now, Wayne LaPierre joined the NRA a year later. Uh, his claim to fame within the organization is by 1986. He led the effort to roll back the uh, formal law, the Gun Control Act of 1968, which had radicalized the hardliners in the NRA, leading them to launch this assault and take over the organization in 1977. And that Firearms Owner Protection Act rolled back part of that gun control law of 1968. It weakened some of the provisions of the prior 1934 law. And um, uh, it's really the most important 
gun law passed uh, since 19, since the 1968 law. Uh, and what we've had since has been uh, the assault weapons ban that came and went and background checks that still are problematic, although Biden now purports uh, and aspires, as he says, to, uh, to, to make them more robust. The NRA also expanded concealed carry. In the early 80s, very few states had concealed carry where you could carry a weapon uh, uh, hidden on you if you're a resident. Now most states have those, uh, have those laws. Um, now, uh, I also, one thing about the Parkland shooting, there was a lot of discussion, well, they missed red flags, right? They accused the police of missing red flags of the shooter. There's a chapter in the book called The Family Sport, which is all about the Newtown Sandy Hook shooting. And it's really about how the entire community in Southern Connecticut, which is infused with NRA instructors, NRA former board members, NRA current board members, NRA sponsored youth uh, shooting competitions and youth clubs, infused with NRA uh, activities and an NRA present, all missed the red flags of the shooter in the Newtown of the Newtown School, even though those flags were apparent. We can talk about that if you wish. Now. Uh, I'm going to conclude now. We're going to go back to Norm uh, in a minute and go back to Norm. What's the NRA secret, right? I remember the, 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 the CNN town, law, town hall after the Parkland shooting back in 2018, and one of the students asked uh, Marco, Senator Rubio, you know, are you willing to give up NRA member, money? The NRA, the money that the NRA gives to pro-gun candidates is not that important, and it is not as important as the money that the NRA devotes to attack ads. Before with front groups, now due to Citizens United, they don't have to even bother hiding it, right? They can hide it. Uh, it's easier to hide it. But attack ads attacking uh, gun control candidates. And in the past, they've, they've been quite successful at that. Now, with the strength of the gun reform movement, it seems like it's going to be harder. The gun industry is also very important. And I remember having this discussion with Lawrence O'Donnell on MSNBC after the Newtown shooting. And a lot of people think, well, the NRA is just an extension of the gun industry. Not true. The NRA and the gun industry have been joined at the hip since before they, the NRA was founded. Because Church, when he started running uh, Wingate's rifle manual, the back pages were full of gun ads. It's a model they've continued since. But the gun industry supports the NRA, but it does not control the NRA. And it's not the secret of the NRA's strength. The secret of the NRA's strength is the ideology. What trumps in 2018, after the weekend, uh, that August weekend of first the El Paso and Dayton shootings, they call it the slippery slope, and all of a sudden everything is taken away, right? Meaning that even a little gun control like background checks precipitates a slide to disarmament, to disarmament precipitates a slide to the Holocaust. And none of this is true, right? This is a complete canard, not true at all. I wrote about it in the New Republic before the elections. And um, we can discuss that if you wish. But it's not a matter of historical revisionism. It's a matter of fabulous invention. And this book is what, is what it's based on. This is by an NRA-funded scholar published by an NRA-financed, uh, to some degree, think tank, though. Other scholars have gotten more. The linchpin is they claim that the Nazis used prior gun control, gun registration lists to then come and seize weapons from the Jews and facilitating their ability to then carry out the Holocaust. Yet buried in the back of this book, 230 page book on page 181 reads, police reports listing weapons seized from Jews have been difficult to locate. Many such records may have been destroyed during the war, either by the Nazis themselves uh, or due to allied bombing, right? That, just, that is simply not credible. The Nazis kept meticulous records and all the other known records of the Holocaust survived. There's no evidence that any of them were destroyed by the war or destroyed by the Nazis. It's not what the Nazis do. So this is simply another canard. But the problem is, the issue is, even as the NRA is, is fading into the sunset, right, and perhaps on its last legs, and I think it will resurface in some other form, but it's really, it's really on its out as we know it. Even as they, as they do that, don't take too much comfort in that if you're in favor of gun reform, because the ideology they put out will endure. Because the ideology has convinced a great many of those 74 million um, uh, uh, Trump supporters who voted for him, along with, I think, most, if not nearly all, of the leadership of the, G the GOP, that gun control, like Biden is proposing now, poses an existential threat 
to their freedom and their very lives and not just their ability to keep to keep their weapons. And I'm concerned that within the next day or two, you're going to see like Ted Cruz um, wearing masks uh, 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 saying, Molo Lobby, come and take my guns, right? And, and others. This is the one issue that could unite uh, conservatives from the moderates, the gamers, as Timothy Snyder called Mitch McConnell, willing to cheat to, uh, but not steal the system to the people willing to outright steal it like the representatives who are QAnon supporters. And I think it poses a tremendous amount of potential opposition to Biden's gun plans and plans for gun reform. And I think if the gun reform movement wants to achieve their goals in my lifetime, let's say, or in, in the coming years, that these myths, these big lies by the NRA need to be challenged. And one thing we've learned from recent events is that if you start to challenge extremism, extremism has its limits. You see people flocking out of the, of the GOP now, it seems. And I think, um, I think the gun reform movement, if they're going to get somewhere, need to start challenging these myths, these lies, these fabulous tales told by the NRA. So with that, Norm, that's uh, under 40, which was my goal. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to you and, uh, and we'll continue. Well, Frank, thank you so very much. And uh, just an incredible wealth of knowledge in, uh, in this book. And again, as I said at the beginning, if you'd like a copy of this book, you can get one by donating to The Progressive magazine, a $50 donation to The Progressive if you go to uh, progressive.org slash event. Uh, you can um, uh, make a, uh, a fifty dollar donation, and we will mail a copy of this book to your home. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, a room of one's own bookstore, a local bookstore here in Madison, a local independent bookstore, which um, is co-sponsoring this event tonight. And if you are able to uh, buy a copy of a book. Uh, in a bookstore, please buy it in a local independent bookstore, uh, whatever part of the country you are in, uh, those of you that are listening to us uh, live today or in the future on the uh, recorded version of this talk. Again, the Progressive Magazine, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's a bi-monthly magazine. This is our newest issue just out uh, a week or so ago, and uh, if you want to subscribe, it's progressive.org slash subscribe. You can get um, that magazine delivered to your home or workplace, or you can get a gift subscription to give to your favorite uh, uncle or uh, NRA member. Um, with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. And we've had a number of people commenting already in the chat um, that, uh, that they really appreciate the wealth of knowledge, Frank, that you bring to this, and I want people to uh, to really use, take advantage of this uh, opportunity to speak directly to you and uh, ask these questions. I'm going to start off because I've known you as a journalist for many, many years. We both worked in uh, Central America at the same time. You've you've done quite a bit of of other work. What got you interested in writing this uh, really incredible tome about the NRA? You know, I was um, in 1993, I was following the crime bill uh, in Congress and the crime bill. This, this is the bill that eventually uh, passed, included and passed the temporary or 10 year assault weapons ban. But the crime bill also had a safety valve for nonviolent drug offenders and groups like Families Against Mandatory Minimums were struggling to get that passed. And um, the other side included groups like the NRA, and the NRA was running ads attacking uh, the safety valve, saying Congress is going to let 10,000 drug dealers out of prison, without mentioning that these were nonviolent drug offenders, not violent offenders, number one, and number two, not mentioning guns at all, and not always even mentioning that it was coming from the NRA, that the NRA was behind this ad. So I already had an interest in the NRA, but I thought, why in the world would the NRA be interested in, 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 in getting rid of this, this safety valve, which made sense from a public policy perspective, at least in my mind, when it had nothing to do with guns. And um, it was part of their ploy to try and leverage other issues, which they've now done successfully, uh, to ingratiate themselves into the mainstream of the Republican Party. But that's when I took an interest in the NRA and um, 
The NRA sent me to cover an NRA annual meeting in Minneapolis in 1994, uh, where I saw the beginning of an epic struggle, which is covered in the book called The Politburo, an epic struggle that was so fierce, it radicalized the NRA even, even more than it already was after the Cincinnati revolt, because the uh, a hardliner was accusing everyone under the sun of being soft on gun rights or not as hard on gun rights as he was. And uh, Wayne LaPierre, who, who had only come in in 91, so this was three years into his tenure, ended up recruiting Charlton Heston by the late 90s in order to defeat this challenge to his power. So it's, it was really quite a story. And then I covered the NRA annual meeting in Oklahoma City, I'm sorry, in Phoenix, one month after the Oklahoma City bombing. And it was there, uh, I covered that. And one thing that occurred is I, I, a man that I met uh, gave me a flyer from the National Alliance. So the National Alliance that had inspired the Oklahoma City bomber was recruiting on the floor of the NRA convention in Phoenix in 1995. And it felt, it, it led the leadership of the NRA to denounce them from the dais and say, you're not welcome here, go home. And the flyer that I got, I showed it to an NRA official, Tanya Matoxa, and I'll never forget what she said. I also report it in The Voice. She says, well, people can pass out literature for the communists. It doesn't mean we're, that we're communists, which was what we call in the business a non-denial denial that uh, neo-Nazis were on the floor. They've since, I, they, the NRA has since really policed it that they don't allow anybody to distribute anything that isn't authorized anymore. But that's how I got started. Hmm. Uh, so a, a question from a, uh, a listener here, uh, for gun reform purposes, would you say it's important to do more groundwork challenging the gun rights ideology before proposing certain reforms like gun registration? Yes, absolutely. That's the main point. Thank you, Kata. I see that too. Um, you know, the, the gun registration to them is, uh, is, you know, if you've seen the movie Red Dawn, right? That's the closest they have to evidence to prove their thesis, right? That if you have gun registration, that the Nazis or the socialists are going to come in the night, kick down the door, take away your guns, take your family to concentration camps and kill all of you, right? And you think, well, who would believe that? Well, certainly the people that took over the Capitol on January 6th would. This needs to be challenged now, because if not, the opposition has the potential to be incredibly disruptive. Constitutional sheriffs will refuse to comply. Attorney generals and governors may refuse to comply with any federal, any, any attempts to impose a federal or national gun control law. So you've got it, you've got to challenge that before you're going to be successful, successful in implementing that. That is my point. And thank you for asking that. Uh, our friend Bill asks, uh, what's the single most surprising thing you found about the NRA while researching this book? Mm. Um, how, well, a few things. I think one thing is how, how cool the, the, the co founder not entirely cool, right? There were some problems there, right? There's, you know, uh, William Coney Church talked about whipping the Indians to keep them in the line, Native Americans, right? And that's an abomination and indefensible, right? But he also talked about, and I found this amazing, he actually said in, 18, in the 1890s, 50 years before the military integrated, that the military should prohibit the use of the N word, right? And uh, and uh, the D word, uh, D A G O, right? And a slur against Italian Americans, like uh, to some degree, me and Bill, and, and Bill, right? As an insult, right? Because it was demoralizing to morale. That was, I thought, wow, that's that's pretty cool. And the other thing is how green they were. They were as they really were green in the late sixties and early seventies. They were very cool right out for as far as I'm concerned. They were true environmentalists and they were thinking of moving out of Washington and setting up in the Rockies and really becoming a full sporting organization, an organization dedicated to environmental sustainability. And I did not realize that until I researched the book. And thank you for the question, Bill. Um, someone asks uh, from the March for Our Lives a poster read, if every black person had a gun, they would be outlawed. Now. You actually reported for us at the Progressive about this incident that happened in California in, I think it was 1967, when the Black Panthers showed up at uh, the State House in Sacramento armed, and then uh, Governor, at that time, Ronald Reagan, uh, instituted uh, gun legislation in the state of California. Talk, talk about that story. 
You know, the race issue is very complicated, and it's not as simple as people think, right? Um, in 1967, in April of 1967, and I can, um, I can uh, read this to you. In April of 1967, the NRA came out, and um, the NRA came out uh, with some positions. And the positions that they took were that gun control was absolutely necessary. And um, this is in April 1967, three weeks before the, the Black Panthers, led by Bobby Seale, took over the California State House. And this is a statement that was also in testimony. The NRA does not advocate an ostrich attitude, you know, sticking your head in the sand toward firearms legislation. We recognize that the dynamism and complexities of modern society create new problems which demand new solutions. Accordingly, the National Rifle Association has come forth with a positive, specific, and practical program for reasonable and proper firearms controls. Right, and there's and there's other there's other statements that are similar. So the NRA by '67 was coming around to the conclusion after the assassination of JFK, and then and then and this is even before the assassinations of Bobby of uh, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy that gun control was necessary. Right, they had opposed it in the '60s, but they were coming around. And the Black Panther, they helped write the legislation in California quietly, which helped, which which led Ronald Reagan then to to make the carrying of weapons like the Black Panthers did illegal in California. And that was a function of racism on the part of the California Republican Party. And the NRA didn't care about that, but it was already moving the it was already moving in the direction that the NRA itself wanted to go. And I think that's important. We see now a number of groups, uh, black groups. I've seen groups at NRA conventions wearing T-shirts, Black Guns Matter, and a number of groups have formed. Some of them are more, more right-leaning. Some of them are more left-leaning. I think that's important on some level, but it's also something that um, doesn't really change the equation because some of the most important spokesmen and spokespeople for the NRA now are African-Americans. Candace Owens is becoming one, right? Dan Bongino is another. Right, Colleen Noir uh, is is a third, uh, and he's no longer with the NRA, but he's but he's still quite influential. So, um, and Alan West, of course, the NRA board member, the Texas GOP chair, uh, is also an African American. So, um, it's it's an issue that needs more exploration, and that's why I think it's important to challenge those myths about having allegedly stood with freed slaves uh, and the Holocaust, but especially on it comes to race about freed slaves. Because that is not true at all, but it's an attempt to say, see, we're not racist. It's gun control itself, which is racist. And it's just a, a complete bunch of baloney. Is there any coincidence between the uh, the beginning of the NRA right around the time of uh, Reconstruction or the end of Reconstruction? And the NRA and who? Sorry? The, the, say the beginning of the NRA occurring right around the same time as the end of Reconstruction. Well, it wasn't the end of Reconstruction. It was the height of Reconstruction. Right, 18, Reconstruction 18, ended, started 18, before the end of the war, depending on, right. on who you on who you read. And it was so it was six years into Reconstruction since the end of the war. Right. And then they had six years to go. It was it was the height of Reconstruction. It wasn't it was less Reconstruction itself, right, than the fact that it was the start of the Gilded Age or the eve of the Gilded Age. And they just they had already uh, put the for the last spike, the golden spike in the first transcontinental railroad. So Church and Wingate knew the United States was emerging as a great power, and eventually they were going to be drawn into wars with Europe. That really was what uh, was going on. Um, another listener is asking about connections between the NRA and the January 6th Capitol insurrection. You know, there's been some stories about that. The NRA, you have to remember, is a very cautious organization, right? I would argue the modern NRA is a very cynical organization as well, but they're cautious. They didn't get involved in the Tea Parties. They weren't sure which way that was going to go. They doubled down and went in 100% or 100, maybe 200% with Donald Trump. We know that. Uh, but they, and they support the right to carry weapons and the right to armed insurrection. And there's bits and pieces where people, uh, where that's been said and was recently uh, brought out by a number of Nick Huffington Post and some others. And that's good and that's all true. But the NRA kept its distance from this because this went beyond, they knew this was going to blow up. They're smart enough to realize they didn't want to have their fingerprints on it, even though they're the ones that have put out the ideology, the ideology of the slippery slope and the canard about the Holocaust, 
which is part of what's really driving this along with support of Trump. So they have, you know, they, they are part of that movement. They set the foundation for that. Uh, and I think they also, it could be argued, set the foundation for the rise of Trump from their activities over the year, demonizing anyone in favor of gun control and most of them of the Democratic Party. But, I, but they didn't play any direct role that I'm aware of, and I don't think they would uh, in what occurred. Although Alan West, the Texas GOP chair and NRA board member, wrote something which was very elliptical about the subject, but he basically said, that's why we were there. He wasn't there, but he's identifying that we were there. So, they, so in that sense, he supported it. But he is, again, is a whistleblower within the NRA, and he's even more radical overtly than other members of the, uh, of the leadership in the NRA. So a couple of people are asking about uh, effective um, ways to change people's minds about some of these issues. The fact that, um, you know, the, uh, the scare tactics that are being used to uh, uh, get people to support the NRA, how do you counter that? with um, uh, information? Well, you know, I think you've seen what the Lincoln Group has done, right? Uh, the Lincoln Project, right? Uh, in terms of the last election, putting out ads that have really, uh, I think, damaged, uh, called President Trump out for the inaccurate and, uh, and extremist things that he has said. And I think something similar could be done for the NRA to call them out, especially the fact that what kind of organization has to lie about the origin of their own organization to achieve their modern political ends? If that isn't a giant vulnerability, I don't know what is. And some ads that point that out, that actually exhume the documents and show some of even the imagery, because there were you know, te no television in 1871, but there were sketches or 1874 of the competitions on Creedmoor Range. That could be done, and I think that would go a long way because a lot of gunners would say, gee, I didn't know that. Why did they lie to me? Why have they been lying about their own organization? So, yes, I think a lot can be done. And there are people, like I said, Shannon Watts is very much engaged in the political process and quite effective. But the Parkland students, uh, you know, they I've, I watched Us Kids by Kim Snyder, who's also a friend of mine, and a great film that captures the spirit of what they're trying to do. And there's a great scene where... David Hogg and others are engaged in conversation with gun owners, and they actually come to like each other. But the conversation never advances. They say, David Hogg says, well, we don't want to take your guns. And that was enough. But nobody gets down to what actually do you want to do and what would be permissible. So I think this is right to be challenging them, especially when the NRA is spending now all of its money and most of its time defending itself on three fronts right, in, ta in court in Dallas and court again against its own PR partner and in court in New York. So this would be a good time to, uh, to, to challenge them on their lies. And um, I don't know if you can hear me, Frank. I just lost your audio for some reason. But uh, the next question is about the NRA's silence on the, uh, the killing of Philando Castile, who as uh, as people will remember, was the uh, man in Minneapolis who had a licensed firearm in his possession and was telling the police that when he was killed in Minneapolis a um, uh, couple of years ago now. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. The NRA has a, has a um, the modern NRA has a big blind spot when it comes to race. Right. If there's a gun owner or somebody like Alan West or Colleon Noir has a problem with police, they'll defend them. They did not defend Philando Castile. And eventually Dana Lesh came out and said she was speaking on the NRA and she made some qualified remarks. But Colleon Noir, who was with NRA TV and was an NRA uh, paid commentator, now on his own, he came out and said, look, the way I look at it, Col Philando Castile shouldn't have been shot. That shouldn't have happened. So he had the guts to come out and say, this was wrong and to break with the NRA uh, because of that. But there was another case in, uh, in the Smoky Mountains of Virginia, right a week after the uh, George Floyd, or right around the George Floyd uh, death in police custody, a pastor, uh, Leon McRae, I believe was his name, who uh, had people dumping a refrigerator into, his, uh, into uh, a dumpster on his property where he owned an apartment complex. And they, 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 they accosted him and they threatened him. He pulled out his, his, his handgun 
for which he had a legal permit and he called 911. The police came and they arrested him, not the people who were doing the dumping. And they interviewed the people who were doing the dumping, who were all white, and they arrested him and didn't, and didn't want to talk to him or take any questions or didn't care what he had to say, tell the judge in the morning. The sheriff found out about it, released him and gave a public apology. He never should have been arrested. The NRA said nothing about this case. And that's interesting. But the NRA is also very, very cautious. I don't believe that the NRA as an organization said anything about the McCloskeys, which were the couple in St. Louis who had the Black Lives Matter protesters. And the, the, the husband came out with an AR-15 and the wife with a silver bodied pistol. They haven't said anything about that either. Right. So they're very selective, but they're also very cautious. Uh, but they do have a blind spot on race. And that's something else they should be and, and have been called out on. And, you know, during the pandemic, I wanted to do a story just on Leon McRae. Was, I couldn't get it published because the news cycle has so, been so saturated. But, of course, that couple uh, from St. Louis, the McCloskeys, were featured at the Republican National Convention by... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, showing the strength of the gun movement, showing yeah. how radical it's become, right? For the NRA, that was great, but they didn't have to say anything, you know. So, Frank, one question that's coming in is um, you are perhaps the most vocal critic uh, right now about the NRA. Obviously, you published this book, uh, which is, as you say, the unauthorized history. Uh, what kind of pushback are you getting from uh, from the NRA and its allies? Well, remember, we're in a pandemic. I'm getting no pushback or pressure whatsoever because I know the NRA has read the book and I know the NRA has responded to the book as they exhumed um, Merritt Edson, one of the leaders in the in the uh, in the post-war era, and they've also made a few changes uh, on their websites, uh, reminding people that they have one place where they actually mention Church and Wingate and mention a few things that make it look like they're not trying to bury their history. But basically, the NRA strategy to the book is pretend it doesn't exist. So if you want to put the NRA in the corner, if you want to if you want to uh, ex achieve gun reform by diminishing the power of the NRA. You could buy the book, but you could also read the book and start getting that information out there because they're hoping nobody notices this book exists. And, you know, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to make sure that, uh, that people know about not necessarily the book, but the information in it. You talk in the book about two other histories of the NRA, both of which have also been kind of buried by the organization. Oh, I, I, I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sure what that is. I mean, I was thinking about uh, the, 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 well, part of it is they bury the records of, of five, nearly five generations of, of former NRA leaders, nearly all of whom were either National Guardsmen or military officers. They've just buried them because too many of them either didn't support gun control and had nothing to do with the Second Amendment or they supported gun control. So they just buried their entire their entire story. They don't want anybody to know how green they were, for instance, because that shows how much they've changed. They don't want anyone to know that they were a shooting club, uh, basically the nation's largest gun association. And then overnight they, they continued with that shooting club, but turned it into uh, the base of the gun lobby. So it's that that they've that they that they buried and that they don't want anyone to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now. Um one of our listeners asks about um, the moderate factions of the NRA and, and if there's a way to appeal to them and kind of drive a wedge between these uh, white supremacist elements that you mentioned earlier and the neo-Nazi elements and the, uh, the more moderate members of the NRA. Um, you yourself, Frank, are a member of the NRA? <laughs> yes. Yes. Um though I'm not sure if they realize um, uh, how I'm doing that. But yeah, I'm a member of the NRA legally too, but I'm not sure if they understand how I'm doing that. But um, the notion that there are moderates in the NRA, I hear this from from uh, from lefties, right? Uh, fellow progressives say that to me. Well, there must be moderates in the NRA. I've been to a lot of NRA meetings and I've been to gun shows. I've never seen any moderates at all, right? The moderates are people who, uh, who, may, who may be members of the NRA because they have benefits from being members. It may give them access to a gun club or access to the magazines, which are, if you're interested in firearms, right, it's the best, one of the best magazines, and there's a number of them, the Net American Rifleman, American Hunter, America's First Freedom, that show a great deal of firearms. So there are benefits if you're part of the gun community, of which I am, uh, to, to being in the NRA. 
But the notion that moderates are going to take over the NRA, let me tell you right now, that will never happen. And if you read the book, you'll know, you'll understand. Because the NRA is run like a Politburo, as a former board member said. So they had a period where they had a grassroots democracy in there and the NRA, which produced the Cincinnati revolt. It didn't last long and then they consolidated power and they set everything up so there were indirect elections. And you don't vote for people in your state, you vote for a slate of board candidates. And most of the ones who get on the board are uh, nominated by the nominating committee, which is controlled by the board. So to compare it to a, a Politburo is not hyperbolic. It's exactly, it's designed to make sure there be no challenge to their power. Now, you people that were asked that question is thinking, well, there could be a challenge from moderates. That is not what they're worried about. They're worried about a challenge from people more extreme than they are, including white power people, right? That's what they're worried about. And they're worried about people coming in like Oliver North. They're going to start looking into their finances, even though they didn't expect him to do that. But the notion that you're going to have moderates in the NRA is not going to happen. But if you start challenge the NRA on their ideology, on the canards, the, the BS that they put out, then I think you might start seeing people leave the NRA and then it's possible they could gravitate to a number of other groups that have been formed that so far are going nowhere, right, or really aren't getting, getting much traction. Now, uh, we started off at the beginning. Uh, we had just gotten the news about um, uh President Biden's statement today uh, uh, about background checks, about other uh, banning um, uh, automatic weapons. And I wonder if you could just talk about what pressures the Biden administration is going to face from the NRA as it uh, moves forward with an agenda of that sort. Well, the NRA has already uh, put up on Instagram that they're going to fight for. The NRA is going to use this for fundraising. This is perfect for them. And it's going to take uh, deflect attention away from the fact that LaPierre, part of the charges are that he has, you know, racks of, of, of $20,000 Italian suits and uh, and a bunch of other, you know, things that he's in personal enrichment, including, oh, well, as his chief of staff and other former chief of staff and other members. So it's a good deflection for them. But... They're not, uh, they're not the ones that the Biden administration has to worry about. The NRA has already done the damage. They have to worry about Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Mitch McConnell, right? Uh, I don't even want to say her name, but the, the QAnon rep from Georgia, the QAnon rep from Colorado. These people are all going to now unite. And like I said, Mitt Romney from Utah is a pro-gun state. He might support universal background checks. Uh, uh, Joe... Uh, uh, Joe Man Manchin and Toomey, who supported background checks before, will support it again. They might pass. But this has the potential to reunite the Republican Party. The split we've seen between the pro-Trumpers and the anti-Trumpers just now with the impeachment trial, this has the runs the risk without any exaggeration of reuniting that group. And there are people that are going to try to exploit this, this attempted gun control just to do that, which could become obstructionist and could make it harder for, uh, for everything else the Biden administration wants to do. On top of that, the, the, uh, the, the, the margin in the Senate is so thin, the filibuster is still in place. And so it's going to be very hard to get around that. And there's talk about repealing that. But even then, there's going to be tremendous resistance. So I really think, and, and I, it gives me no pleasure to say this, but I think gun control is going to have to wait, except for background checks. I'd be surprised if the Biden administration, at least over the next two years, manages to pass any more. Now, if the midterm elections, if they could, if they can get uh, control of the, of the Senate up to 60 votes, that would change everything. But the other thing you have to remember is that the Roberts court has a new composition. Roberts is now among the minority to the right of a hardline conservative bloc without him. And uh, Amy Cohen, Justice uh, Cohen, is a strong gun rights uh, advocate, and so is Gorsuch. So everything that the Biden administration wishes to do would be challenged in court. And the Democrats, I do not have the votes to expand the court, as Schumer talked about uh, uh, back when the judicial appointments were made. So I think, you know, I, you know, we're in for a long road ahead, years, years before we're going to actually see meaningful, lasting gun, gun control in this country. Now, one um, one listener asks. I mean, the, the Second Amendment really is about organized militias, which are which are now uh, called the National Guard. 
And is there any way of, of amending or clarifying the Second Amendment? And I think the answer to that is comes in what you just said about the Supreme Court, um, that uh, particularly with the new um, uh, Trump appointees on the court, Amy Coney Barrett and Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh, that um, it was the Supreme Court that clarified the Second Amendment already to uh, to favor the NRA interpretation, correct? Yeah, but you know, the thing about the Supreme Court decision, the Scalia decision in Heller versus the District of Columbia, which established for the first time an individual right to, uh, to at least keep arms in the home for one's protection. That is, a, his decision still left it open that the government, that the government or diff, different levels of government, federal, state, and others, can prohibit weapons in certain areas like schools or hospitals or buildings, that the government can has the power to regulate commerce of firearms. So the notion that the, the Heller decision is not, does not prohibit uh, future gun control. Everything that Biden can do can fit within the Heller decision. The problem is the new court may rule that it may be unconstitutional based on that decision and a, a new interpretation of that decision or based on another, another, another legal ruling. And I think that poses a greater threat. Scalia's decision itself, I don't think is a barrier to future gun control. I think it's more that the court could find other reasons uh, other legal reasons or other excuses, depending on your perspective, to uh, to impede future gun control and rule it unconstitutional. And certainly, that's why it's important to challenge the myths of, that the NRA is pulling out, because that would make it harder to listen to them when they're lying about American history, world history, and themselves uh, to be able to do that. And that's why I think this is going to be a long haul, and it's going to be in part an ideological battle, a battle about facts and history as opposed to extremism and inventions. Let's talk um, for a moment about some of these activist groups. Of course, uh, today is the third anniversary of the tragic uh, shooting in Parkland, Florida at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Uh, and there was a piece in the Miami Herald uh, today that that um, uh, I was looking at talking about uh, what you know, some of those activists are doing. We have groups like Moms Demand uh, Action and Every Town that are working on these issues. What's the future for um, all of these groups, uh, you know, working on these issues from the outside, trying to pressure politicians? Well, you know, um, for years, people in the gun rights community, and there's a blogger named Sebastian with the Pennsylvania Gun Blog, who's one of the smartest, most honest uh, gun rights, uh, independent journalists, independent bloggers out there. And um, he he's written some things that say, look, you know, we're not worried about those gun reform groups because, you know, what we have is genuine grassroots support for, for gun rights. And he's right about that. And the gun reform groups, they're like AstroTurf because Bloomberg buys the AstroTurf. You can lay it down, but it'll never grow because it's fake right? It's a lot of theater. It's a lot of activities. And I think that was true 10, 15 years ago. I don't think that's true anymore, right? You now have a bona fide grassroots movement for gun reform and it's energized and it's invigorated. And I think that gives a gr great deal of opportunity to keep going. But I think the gun reform movement needs to pace itself. It needs to realize they have not reached the mountaintop, right? With guidance gun plans. Right. I don't I think background checks have a reasonable chance of passing. I don't think the rest of it really does. I'd be surprised if other measures were to pass. Right. And I'm not I'm not, this gives me no pleasure to say that. But they're going to have to pace themselves. And if they're going to take this for the long haul. Right. And the other thing that people need to realize, another weakness in on, on the other side, the gun rights argument is that the evidence against it is not just the fact that they've made all this stuff up. It's the fact that every other advanced nation on earth has gun control based on the registration of firearms to the owner of those firearms to the degree that they allow for civilian ownership of firearms at all. In some of those nations, New Zealand and Australia has led to uh, the confiscation of semi-automatic weapons or assault rifles, right? In other nations, such as the United Kingdom, you can have weapons, but they have to be in a locker and kept in the gun range, right? There are very clear restrictions, right? And 
all of those nations, every one of them, Canada, nations in Western Europe, and Japan, right, all have exponentially less gun violence than we do. And I would like to see uh, news outlets that have focused on the gun issue, like the New York Times, like the Trace, which is great, right, focused on uh, a real uh, constant uh, reporting on the gun movement. There's very little reporting on how gun control works in other nations and how they have ex exponentially less gun violence than we do. And that's the part of the equation that needs to be introduced because we put the blinders on. We're not even aware of them, right? It's about the second amendment. It's about freedom or the, you know, or the other side, David Hogg say, well, I don't want to take away your guns, but you're not saying exactly what you do want, right? And how that would work because now gun registration is on the table. It hasn't been on the table in 50, 50 years, right? Since Johnson raised it when he signed the gun control act of 68, he singled out the NRA because they supported the bill, they supported the law, but they still opposed gun registration. And Johnson said, this isn't good enough. We need gun registration. For 50 years, nobody has raised gun registration at all in this country until Cory Booker did, right? Senator Booker during the last election cycle, right? And he, he, should, he gets some credit, I think, for raising it. Now it's part of, and that, even Biden in their plan they didn't, they didn't, they weren't forthright about it. They snuck it in the back door underneath the buyback campaign. And then they changed it and finally gave it its own headline. So it shows you how sensitive this is. But that's all because we've been wearing blinders. Of course you have gun registration. And the notion that, well, you can't have gun registration because it'll, you know, because it'll lead to, it'll lead to a, a, a genocide is ridiculous. It's, it's giving more credence to the movie Red Dawn than to actual uh, Holocaust scholarship. And so there's a lot to work with here, but it's uh, it's time to work for people to roll up their sleeves and get to work, I think. Now, earlier in our talk, you mentioned gun shows, and I was just thinking about um, uh, last last summer when uh, when you could still uh, uh, last summer meeting a year ago when you could still travel around. Uh, I was covering the Iowa caucuses and. Uh, uh, our photographer and I stumbled on a big gun show that was happening just just outside where the Iowa uh, caucuses were taking place, where 23 of the presidential candidates all spoke within two days. And at that gun show, you could buy just about anything. And so one of our listeners asked the question about gun show loopholes and can they be closed? Can Is that something where there could be legislation? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That could be closed, right? And part of what uh, the plan, uh, according to the NRA, Biden's plan would end private transfers of weapons. This is a problem and a legitimate problem for a father who wants to uh, give us give his his father's weapon, his father's hunting rifle, right, a Remington BDL Deluxe, for instance, to his son, right, the kind of thing you'd use to build uh, in his family. People that hunt in Pennsylvania might use, right, and I think that's that's to be respected. You don't want to uh, belittle that. But you don't want private transfers of guns at, at, at gun shows. So that could be imposed. But the problem is the ATF, which is the federal agency, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and now explosives, in charge with enforcing national gun control laws, has been so weakened and so beaten by congressional uh, uh, attacks, right, including the, uh, the whole Mexico, the Fast and Furious uh, scandal, which was a scandal but blown completely out of proportion, the, the, the degree of federal enforcement to, to enforce gun control has been limited by Congress itself. So all this would have to change, right, um, including, which is starting to happen, allowing the Centers for Disease Control to look at gun violence like a pandemic. Mm -hmm. All these things need to be done in concert. And the NRA has, has, on its own terms, been successful at keeping this all at bay, saying if you, if, you, if you yield on any one of them, the whole house of cards will collapse. And the rest of the society pays the price. And now I think there's potential to turn that around, but it's going to take a while. You mentioned the CDC. And of course, um, it's probably been a decade or more since Physicians for Social Responsibility took up uh, gun violence as a public health issue. And I know other groups have as well. What's the chance of something like that getting uh, getting more traction with the public in general? Well, I think if studies can come out, you can demonstrate the link between uh, gun ownership and guns in circulation and gun laws and violence. You could you can go a long way. But here's the problem, and this is and this is another way to look at it. What the NRA has done, part of the blinders they put on, is that they are comfortable 
with largely the 1934 law. They don't want to admit it because it bans fully automatic weapons, and they don't want to admit that they're they're comfortable with that, but they're largely comfortable with that. They're largely comfortable with the way the United States regulates wholesale firearms commerce, right? They don't have a big problem with that, and they've weakened some of the provisions so firearms dealers are less likely, have less penalties facing them if they if they do something on the margins, right? What separates the United States from other nations, other advanced nations, is that we don't have any national regulation of any meaning uh, to speak of to regulate retail gun sales. And that's really what we're fighting about, though you would never, nobody's ever thought to think of it that way because of the blinders. Because what can happen now is I can drive to West Virginia and buy $8,000 worth of weapons, pay uh, a local resident a few thousand dollars to buy them for me, and then drive to, a, to Detroit or Chicago or, or another city and then sell them on the black market. Not for that much of a markup because it's so easy to do. A lot of people do it, right? And this is what's fueling uh, uh, crime guns, as the, as the ATF calls them, when they, when they confiscate them that have been used in guns. That's what's fueling. That's why all, a lot of the, the statistics put out by NRA paid scholars are totally misleading because they're looking at all, apples and oranges. Yeah, you know, gun laws are, in, are, are restrict in one place, but they're not strict somewhere else. When you have uh, open borders, it doesn't work. And that's why I would like to see more research on, on gun control and, and, and gun violence or the lack thereof in other advanced nations, because that would be a real comparison. Yeah, I mean, I think that certainly there's been mention of the fact that the, you know, the number of gun deaths in the United States is is so much larger than any other uh, country in the world developed or otherwise. But um, I think that, you know, the reasons for that have not been explored as much. And maybe that's something that uh, we could get uh, we could get you to work on an article for the progressive about. I'm always interested. <laughs> So we're speaking with Frank Smythe. The book is The NRA, The Unauthorized History. Again, if you'd like a copy of the book, you can go to our website, progressive.org slash events, and you can, uh, or event, I think it's a single event, and um, you can uh, donate to The Progressive and get a copy of that book. You can also uh, subscribe to The Progressive magazine at progressive.org slash subscribe. And you can also read a bunch of stuff that uh, Frank has written for us over the years about Sandy Hook, about um, uh, Newtown, about uh, Parkland, and uh, also that story about the uh, 1967 uh, Black Panthers in the California State House in Sacramento. We've got time for uh, a couple more questions. If anybody would like to uh, chat something into us. And um, Frank, I'm going to ask this while we're waiting to see if anybody else throws another question into the chat. But every time we have one of these tragic mass shootings, there's a cry, an outcry for uh, action. And every time we see people in Congress sort of backpedaling and saying, you know, yes, we should do something, but then in fact, they don't. Uh, what is the tipping point that will um, make the difference? Well, I hope the tipping point is not another horrific tragedy or a series of horrific tragedies. And I'm afraid that uh, that may be the road we're headed down. I'm hoping that more information and challenging the NRA and the gun rights uh, extremists on their myths could help precipitate that tipping point. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're at the tipping point. We're closer, right? The, the gun reform movement is closer than they've ever been, but the nation is not yet at the tipping point. Um, but I'm not sure what that would be, uh, except for the gun reform movement to get stronger over time. And of course, um, as, as one caller notes, you know, the United States is also the largest manufacturer of uh, military weapons and uh, the military industrial complex, as well as the, the money involved in the production and distribution of uh, firearms is certainly a, uh, a compelling factor in, in all of this. Yeah. And one thing that is in Biden's gun plan from the summer, which I don't believe he mentioned uh, now, they might have pulled it off the table, but we do have a national shortage of, of ammo in this country, right? I've never seen that before. So you attempt to uh, ban ammo sales, you're banning commerce in the gun industry's fastest growing sector. So I don't think uh, this has all been thought through.
right, how this would go. And I think that there's nothing wrong with gun ownership, right? The problem is it shouldn't be as easy to buy a gun as it is to like, well, I'm going to buy some beer, pick up some cigarettes, get a loaf of bread and uh, get some ammo. And you know what? I'm going to get a new handgun while I have it because I just need to show my driver's license. That's nuts, right? And that's what we have in most states in this country. Just a driver's license is enough for you to buy a weapon. And it needs to be something closer to buying a car than buying uh, than buying alcohol or cigarettes. And and one uh, listener asks, how does this laxness in U.S. gun laws um, result in U.S. weapons ending up in the hands of um, uh, gangs and drug cartels in in Mexico and Central America? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, that's a very good point. It fuels, especially weapons going to drug cartels in Mexico. There's no doubt about that. And John Lindsay Poland, I know, is a, f- a friend of mine who works on this issue, mm-hmm. right? And I do, didn't cover that in the book because the book is about the NRA, but that's the side effect, right? I've been an arms trafficking investigator for Human Rights Watch, looking at arms around the world or different continents. And in Latin America, you see a great number of AR-15s throughout the hemisphere that are all fueled by our retail market that are then smuggled over the border into the, into Mexico and then make their way further south. And that is a real problem. So if you were to curb, uh, put greater controls on firearms in the United States, it would curb the flow to some degree uh, to these other nations, right? In other parts of the world, it was the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Berlin Wall that led Kalashnikovs among Eastern Bloc nations to be distributed in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. But in our hemisphere, this hemisphere, it's all about American weapons. And of course, that's why gun manufacturers buy into the ideology, whether they really believe it or not, because it's boosting gun sales. The NRA, one NR, Kanye uh, Metoxa, an NRA lobbyist said, the gun industry should buy me a fruit basket. Because even just the concealed carry laws created a tremendous new market in handguns, concealed, small enough to be concealable, that really uh, was much smaller before. The book, again, the NRA, the unauthorized history. Um, I just want to read this one quote from the book. uh, This is in the introduction. You say, the story of the NRA tracks the life of the nation over the past century, century and a half, and provides a window on the American experience. The NRA has been a major actor through nearly every period of American history since Reconstruction, and not unlike organized baseball, has touched the lives of countless Americans over generations. It's really an amazing, uh, amazing history that you've put together here. And um, one final question from a, uh, a listener out there, Frank, why are you a member of the NRA? Hmm. Why not, right? It's my right. Um, I wouldn't have joined the NRA if I had to misrepresent myself. The NRA used to have, uh, to enter, to join the NRA, you used to have to confirm that you were not a member of a of an insurrectionist or seditious organization, right? And I think they mostly were thinking about the Communist Party at the time. But there's no uh, litmus test to join the NRA. If you pay the money, if you have the card, you get in. So if they want to, if they want to have a, if I had to sign something that said why I couldn't, I had a pledge to support their goals, then I wouldn't have joined. But the fact is, I did join, and it allowed me. It gave me the right, according to the bylaws, to get into board meetings, and I had to fight my way into the last one. Because they tried to keep me out. I had, a, I had to say, hey, I, this is my NRA card. I'm an NRA member. This is in front of a police officer, too, and I'm coming in, right? You can check. You can, you know, because I knew I was in the right, right? Because they're so close. They're so secretive. There's no nonprofit as secretive that I know of as the NRA that they don't even want, they don't want their own members there. If they don't know you, they don't want you there. And, hey, I'm a member. So that's why I joined, uh, to be able to gain access and, you know, I don't quote anybody. I don't burn anybody. I don't write stuff down and then put it and then put it in a story. I never do that. Right. But I just don't I just want to be there and just listen. Right. Just he, just see what's going on. Feel the vibe. And that's much more illuminating uh, than trying to interview people. Right. Especially in this climate. I'm squeeze in one last question here. Um, somebody's asking about some of the other uh, hunting organizations that are um, uh more green in their uh, uh, operations now. And of course, you talk about the history of the NRA as being more uh, pro-environmental than it is today. What about um, driving a wedge 
like that using groups like Ducks Unlimited uh, instead of the NRA as a way to uh, promote, um, I don't know what, what the word is I'm looking for here, uh, but to promote an, uh, ecological and uh, environmental uh, practices. It's a good question, but I don't think it would work, right? I think the, oh, there's a lot of overlap between groups like Ducks Unlimited and the NRA. And anybody standing up and saying, uh, you know, we, we want to do something different from the NRA, we want to work against the NRA, it's going to create tremendous, they're going to call them a FUD, right, which is a fighting word. It's going to become a real, very uncomfortable. I think what they do is if you want to join Ducks Unlimited, you don't have to join the NRA. That's what people are doing. And you want those groups to expand uh, and while the NRA uh, diminishes. Because the NRA has, has traveled so far from its roots that uh, it's really, um, I don't think it's, it, it's a hyperbolic to call it an extremist organization. That Because anytime you're lying about your own history and lying about history in general, that fits the definition for me of extremism. And Ducks Unlimited is not like that at all. Neither is Trout Unlimited, which I've been a member of, uh, and others. And your predictions as we close here on the um, both the, the uh, bankruptcy case in uh, New York State and now the, uh, the case that's just been opened up in Texas. I think the, uh, the NRA is going to get clobbered in New York State. If it doesn't seek to dissolve them, they're going to end up dissolving themselves. And they're going to just try and fight it out to preserve as many, as much of their assets in Virginia as they can. But their attempt to move to Texas is going to take a while. But I think they will eventually reincorporate under a new federal tax ID so they could change the name. They could do, they could, they could, they could, it would be still be the NRA, but it also would have different bylaws. So it would really be a big deal. And I think that uh, the bankruptcy proceeding is not, is going to be at least frozen until the New York Attorney General lawsuit. Uh, is concluded. And we're also seeing there was division in the board of the NRA and then they sealed ranks. And now it seems like the division is starting to creep out again with this ex-board member quoting uh, other board members unnamed uh, in his filing asking for an independent examiner. And the NRA is also spending tens of millions of dollars, you know, Rudy Giuliani type legal fees on their lawyers, right, to be able to defend themselves in three arenas. And then that's not sustainable in the long run either. Right. So they're going down, but their ideology will remain. Frank my thank you so much for joining us today. Again, the book, The NRA, The Unauthorized History. You can get a copy of it by donating to the Progressive Magazine at our website, progressive.org slash event. You can also buy it in a local independent bookstore. And I want to thank A Room of One's Own Books here in Madison for uh, co-sponsoring this event with us tonight, a virtual event due to the... Um, pandemic that we're all going through. But thank you, everybody who's been uh, with us for the past hour and a half. And uh, you can follow Frank on Twitter at Smythe Frank. Uh, it's down in the chat there at the bottom of this uh, screen. And you can also look at his work at the Progressive Magazine at progressive.org on the web. Thanks again. Thank you, Norm. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. Be careful out there. <laughs>